Schitt's Creek not only has the most eye-catching title for a television show in perhaps the history of the medium, but past that precognitive wordplay lies one of the most wittily written, expertly performed, and wholly hilarious comedies currently on the air. The show has blessed us with the dynamic reunion of Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara as Johnny and Moira Rose, self-obsessed one percenters who begin the show bankrupt in every conceivable way, uh, when their fortune is swindled, forcing them to move to the titular town with their equally spoiled children, played to perfection by Dan Levy and Annie Murphy. Once they dock in Schitt's Creek, the Roses meet a stunning small town tapestry and begin to discover the true meaning of friendship and family. It's just unclear whether they give a shit. <laughs> what is clear is that Dan and Eugene Levy's inspired creation promises in season two, and the just announced season three, to give us even more reasons to love the Rose family and question our sanity for doing so. So with that said, please welcome to the Paley stage creator, executive producer, and star, Dan Levy. Star Emily Hampshire. Star Catherine O'Hara. Star Annie Murphy. Star Jennifer Robertson. And last but not least, star, creator, and executive producer, Eugene Levy. Thank you all Thank so you. much for being here tonight. And I believe we're gonna have 45 minutes of Catherine singing now, right? That's yeah, what's absolutely. happening, that's what we're doing. Oh, yes. I, I could only dream. <laughs> <laughs> um, congratulations on the show. Congratulations on the third season pickup. That is very, very exciting. Thanks. You guys were, that's right. Um, but before we talk about like two and three, I kind of want to take it back for a minute and Dan and Eugene, talk a little bit about the inception of the show. I mean, what was the germ of an idea that gave us Schitt's Creek? Um, well. The germ? Do you want to talk about the germ? <laughs> yeah. You uh, had the germ. I what? You came to me with the germ. I came to you with the germ. I was very ill at the time. Uh, it was, yeah. Um, <laughs> So, uh, you know, we, I had this idea about a family that lost all their money and, you know, it was playing on this sort of uh, idea, this understanding, cultural understanding that we have now of how wealthy people live, you know, via reality television, etc. cetera. Um, and, you know, we'd seen the riches to rags idea explored in a broader sense in, in sitcom land. Two Broke Girls was doing that quite sufficiently and um but we i had never seen that premise explored through sort of the lens of the style of comedy that i thought my dad does so well um so i brought the idea please, please. <laughs> and um and we just started talking, and um, and the idea just started to unfold, and uh, you know, it started out as a lovely father-son project, and I was thrilled to death when he came to me and said, "Do you want to help me work on a television show?" <clears throat> and my thing was, "This would be good. Let's see how far we can take it." Here we are, coming into our third <laughs> season. Yeah. It's pretty surreal, actually. Really? Yeah, well, you, I mean, you sit down in a living room and say, okay, well, does this idea have legs? And, you know, next thing you know, we're, we, yeah, we're here. It's, an, it's insane. I mean, it's not only does an idea have legs, but it's an idea that you, you guys created, you executive mm -hmm. produce, you're writing, you're starring in. I mean, I know... David likes hats, but I feel like that's a lot for you. I mean, but do you <laughs> find different kinds of hats? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but do you find that it actually helps? Because I feel like when you're that invested and you sort of have your hand in so many pots, it probably makes the entire endeavor feel easier in a strange way. Yeah, I, I feel like I, I mean, we all, I think at this point know the show so well, but going into the first season, I think having been in the room writing it and having, you know, been in, you know, my dad's living room talking about it from such an early stage, you come to the, to the project with such a clear idea mm -hmm. because you've had all that work um, done in advance. And I think that, that did inform a lot of, um, you know, my decision making and our decision making when it came to everything from the costumes to the 
way that I had a, a big Pinterest board of set ideas <laughs> um, that, our, that our art department was like, first of all, who is this kid? Yeah. And right. what is he doing with his Pinterest boards? Yeah, that's great. Um, but it was very clear. Yeah. And I think that whole experience of creating something and actually seeing it come to life like some kind of pop-up book, it was the most <laughs> insane experience walking onto set the first day and, and seeing it all. Yeah, there. his his thumbprint is all over the show. Eugene, what has it been like for you to sort of be in this endeavor with him and work together so closely in so many different capacities? What is it like? Well, it's kind of surreal in a way. I mean, you know, it, it right out of the gate in our first show, <clears throat> the thing about starting this show was I knew that the D D D Dan was, I, I call him Daniel, but everybody calls him Dan now, so I'll <laughs> call him Dan. Uh, you know, I knew he had talent. I've been watching him for seven, eight years on, on MTV up in Canada. He was a great on-air personality, you know, doing live television. The after show was a very popular uh, show, and he was doing some wonderful work on that show. but. Coming into a, a, a show like this, which is kind of a half-hour, you know, acting piece, we both knew that we wanted a character-driven comedy, and to do that successfully, so it's not a show about jokes, you need to create characters and have your characters in in, in a place where the audience can have a, an emotional involvement with the characters. It 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 involves comedy and it involves acting, and I thought, geez, I wonder if he can pull it off. That was my only reservation, is his is, is work kind of in, in, in front of the camera. And boy, right, the first show, right out of the gate, it was, he absolutely, uh, you know, blew me away. And he's doing, uh, to me, I mean, honestly, do, just doing amazing work in front of the camera. And I'm, I'm very, very proud. <laughs> We did shoot, we shot a, a small presentation pilot just before that, mm -hmm. um, and I remember <laughs> yes, shooting well. my scenes for it. It was 14 minutes, so you had one scene, and in this particular scene, it was just a very intimate dynamic, and... Um, <laughs> okay, I was getting was a little very, nervous. There was I, was some, getting, I was getting a little oh, nervous. There were right some there. nerves, and I remember, yeah. well... Uh, all, I ca all I kept <laughs> saying to, to uh, Dan <laughs> when we were shooting our little 15-minute presentation pilot about three years ago, maybe four now, was every day he, he would speak very quietly in, in the show. And I would say, I would go up to him and say, <clears throat> Dan, uh, <laughs> Daniel, I think I called him. <laughs> Uh, I think you got to speak up just a little bit. I, I, I think you're 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 a little too quiet. And, uh, yeah, maybe the maybe the sound man is going to have a problem miking you. <laughs> so I think maybe you have to just speak up a little bit. You know. So then we go back and do the scene again, and it's still kind of very you know quiet. I'd say that was good. It was great. It was great. <laughs> if we could hear it, it would be. It would be <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, but I think you, you you have to take it up. And anyway, that was pretty much it. And I thought, well, we'll kind of, I guess, well, if we can kind of mix it at the end, we'll, we'll you know, <laughs> worry about the sound. He was doing great work, but it's just couldn't hear it. But anyway, <laughs> that but that was my ear that wasn't tuning in to what he was doing, because his character honestly hasn't changed that much from the presentation, and it's he's pretty much, you know, he, that's the way David speaks. And it's brilliant. They just and we hear up in post. And we can't hear him. And we can hear him. <laughs> yeah. Um, obviously, it makes all the sense in the world to have someone like Catherine O'Hara in any project, anywhere, at oh, any yeah. time. Um, who, how, how did sort of the idea of bringing her into this project sort of generate with the two of you? Well, she was a last resort. Uh, <laughs> That's all I want to hear. <laughs> Catherine was, um, to be honest, uh, uh, oh, uh, the question is f uh, for Catherine, I guess. How, no, how for you. I mean, obviously well, here, it started with you. Well, here's the thing. Ca Catherine had... Pass. <laughs> you know, it, it was a tough yeah. one because Catherine is, is extremely particular about what she does. She does great work. 
And she was nervous about getting involved in a television uh, show um, because when you, could, when you do a pilot, you're committing to multi years of doing the show. That's just, that's the way it works. And she was extremely nervous about it. And, and when and we, lazy. huh? And I'm lazy. Well, that, <laughs> and the fact. But uh, it was in getting her to do the pilot, um, you know, we, we, you know, I, I, as nicely as I could, I asked, and she was as sweet as she could be, but in saying, you know, I just don't think, I just don't know whether I can commit to it. Honestly, I don't think I can do it. And then I got to, now I'm going to credit Dan, you <laughs> here, uh, because I went on and moved on to try and find another actress to do. <laughs> To do the to do the pilot because she had she had already said no, and uh, and then I called uh, Daniel and I said uh, I said well I I think we have somebody lined up to replace Catherine. He said, okay, maybe you might want to call Catherine back just to see if it's final. I said it sounded pretty final to me. He said. Maybe we should call her back just to see if there's anything we can do to sweeten the thing. So I said to Catherine, look, I said, Catherine, would you do the pilot for us? And you don't, there's no commitment to doing the series. Well, you can do the pilot. And if you don't, if we go to series and you don't want to do it, that's fine. We'll look for somebody else. And, she, and then she said, you know what? Yeah. Oh, OK. Lucky. Well, you did. <laughs> <laughs> To help us out, to help us out, because believe me, it wasn't for the money. <laughs> to help us out, uh, she said yes, and that's, and then that was it. And then, of course, we did go to series. <laughs> so that that was another that was another call I had to make. I mean, Ka Catherine, once you got to play her in the pilot, what was it about that character that you really keyed into and enjoyed playing? I love self-delusional people. <laughs> We all are. I'm going to die someday. <laughs> I, I don't know. I just love um, characters that have no uh, sense of the impression they're making on others. Yeah. You know, so lost in themselves, and um, and there's lots of opportunity in these uh, great scripts to play that. Absolutely. Fun. Really fun. For you, how much did your original sort of envisioning of Moira change once Catherine was sort of in the role and bringing it to life? Oh, I can't take any credit for that. It was... Yeah. Wait, oh, microphone? I oh, thought it was a fan! fan. No, it was it was entirely it was entirely Catherine's inception. It was no. you know we sort of just laid a foundation and everything sort of went from there. Yeah, but the wardrobe was a big part of it, and that's you and Deb Hanson. The, yeah, wardrobe. the wardrobe is a fun is a fun sort of a element sport. of it. I mean, the wall of wigs alone, Catherine, yeah. and the fact that they each have their own name is <laughs> so genius. Oh, God, I, yeah. I mean, it's. Fun. I'm curious, you know, obviously you and Eugene have a very storied relationship in working together on screen. Uh, what is it? Storied? <laughs> no. <laughs> Stor Did I say storied? Storied? Mostly same. Oh, storied. Storied. Um, oh, storied, dear. <laughs> what, is, what has it been like to play the same characters over such an extended period of time with one another as you have on the show? It's freaky. Isn't it? It's kind of, but it's lovely. But at the beginning, the, the first season, I found it, you know, we, yeah, because we were developing, uh, oh, no, <laughs> <laughs> because we were, you know, there was so, so much to work with, but because we were developing a lot of sort of character traits and characters as we went along in the first season, you know, there'd be sort of tense moments like, is that who he's going to be? And, Catherine, just calm down. It's all going to work out. <laughs> you know, kind of, it was those kind of, I mean, it, 
it was it was uh, it, it, it was kind of scary the first season at the beginning, you know, just because you're committing to something you don't know how long it's going. I should be so lucky, I know that, but <laughs> you know, as far as work goes, um, committing to something and it's kind of scary. But then it just uh, and you have to kind of think of oh, this is not uh, you know a one week job or a movie where you're going to say goodbye at the end. And, nice working with you. What the hell. <laughs> you know, this, is, this is where it might you might come and see each other. It helps to work with people you love. It really does. Um, and that, so there's a certain diplomacy. You think, oh well, okay, you can't you know you can't really fight about these things. And Eugene is I really trust Eugene. And now Dan, God bless you. Um, <laughs> So, you know, you just kind of go with the flow, and now it's really lovely. I think it's really fun in scenes. We really only, I mean, we laugh when, we, when we're kind of, one of us is dying in the scene or doesn't know where they're going. <laughs> yeah. But otherwise, was, we take our job seriously, and it's fun. Yeah, I think, the fir I think the first season was a little kind of, uh, you know, a, a little scary in the beginning, you know, for Catherine, because the, the scripts were written kind of with a character in mind, and then we had a, a you know, a great discussion with Catherine about, you know, what her take is on the character, and when that kind of morphed into another character, the character on the page was still kind of the character as it was written, and trying to marry these two things in the page took, you know, t took work, and I'm sure it was, uh, you know, c it created a little bit of stress. This fall marks the 40th anniversary of SCTV, which is Aww. pretty amazing. And I know it can sort of be hard to verbalize sometimes, but Eugene, Catherine, I'm curious, I mean, why do you feel you work so well together? Has it been something that's been present in your working relationship since the beginning, or is it something that as a result of working together so much over the years just exists now? I think honestly not I mean you know talent aside uh, we kind of have the same work ethic Catherine and I I mean we take our work kind of very seriously and you know the funnier something gets the more serious we kind of you know uh, take it so our <clears throat> our approach to the work is very very similar you know mm -hmm. I mean we 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 never take anything for granted we never think oh we're gonna go in and just kill in this scene <laughs> you know I mean there 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 were moments when we were doing you know the the movies uh, with uh, Chris, Chris Guest, Guest when yeah. it's just you know when Catherine and I had a scene <laughs> together we'd be looking at each other saying okay well what's going to happen in the scene what do you think well how, oh, yeah, well, how do you off. see this thing going <laughs> you know because we're just kind of you know letting it letting it go winging it flailing like, flailing in and, front uh, of the camera chris would come over and say you know we're shooting a movie here right <laughs> 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 so, you know, that's what it is, and I think there's just a comfort factor because you know that you're, you're not on one path and, you know, and, and that I'm not on one path and Catherine's on another path. You need that trust to know that you're kind of in the, in the same uh, groove so that, you know, ideas just go back and forth and there is a, you know, kind of a, a trust factor. And I, I think that's, you know, I think that's... I think that's what it what it is. I disagree totally. <laughs> <laughs> no, I totally agree. Yeah, it's true. I mean, Annie, given the fact there is a 40-year relationship on one side, there is a father-son relationship, there's that really what is it like coming into this family that is both artificial for the show, but then sort of real in real life and being the new member? Oh, I mean the the night before we started shooting the first season. I'd just been kind of coasting on the fact that I got the part and, and everything was so great. But I remember falling asleep the night before we started shooting and as I was falling asleep, I just had this wave of terror because I realized what I would have to be doing the next morning with these people that I had looked up to for so long. And um, I couldn't for the life of me think of an excuse as to why I couldn't go into work the next day. <laughs> and, um, and I did and was terrified and shaking and um, but then we got that first take of the first scene out of the way and it just felt it's so corny sorry guys uh, it, but it just felt like family kind of right off the bat and um, even though I was very green and very new I never was made feel like that so yeah very warm you know we've seen sort of like oh. 
In just sort of the one season, we've seen, I don't want to say we've seen her come far emotionally because that would be a lie, but it we've seen, a <laughs> you know, Aww. we've seen through her relationships with some of, you know, with the guys in town, like we <laughs> have seen an openness to sort of what this town offers. I'm curious, in just the span of the first season, what did you enjoy about the little bit that she grew in her time <laughs> in the town? <laughs> well, that, that's what I've, I always liked about Alexis so much because on paper, she's just a downright B. <laughs> <laughs> it's so self-absorbed and, and, you know, caught up in her own world and used to being flattered and complimented. And so on paper, no thanks. But um, there is a side of her that has this, there is a kernel of good. And um, I think Alexis and Johnny in particular have, are similar in the fact that they're, um, they're the ones in the family that are able to see the silver lining in you know, any given situation, is, and even the situation as miserable as living in Schitt's Creek. <laughs> so, um, so that was really fun to take a character who is read one way and, mm -hmm. and play with her and, and make her a little bit more layered. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I think uh, the four sort of actors who play <coughs> Rosemary have done a really amazing job of making the audience feel endeared to these people who on paper are not that nice <laughs> and also in action are not that nice. Um, whereas versus Jennifer, we have Jocelyn, who is probably the nicest person <laughs> on the show, like by yeah. far. She, I mean, first of all, she deserves like a Nobel Prize for taking the last name shit. <laughs> I feel like that's incredible. Also, being married to Roland, probably not, not anyone's no. ideal situation. <laughs> Sometimes I watch the show and I think to myself, like, what does this amazing woman see in this gentleman? And now that you're in front of me, I would like to ask you that question. <laughs> well, I think they genuinely love each other, Roland and Jocelyn. We don't want to think too much about that or what happens behind <laughs> closed doors. <laughs> Um, but they, they genuinely care about each other. I think she takes her position as the first lady of Schitt's Creek quite seriously. <laughs> um, she also, it's kind of, I think that's what's great about the show that was created is the characters are not as simple as they seem. And while Jocelyn is very cheerful and outgoing, she's not stupid. Right. Um, and there, there are things turning in her mind and, um, you know, the, sh the roses are the most exciting thing that's probably happened in the last 10 years. So you might as well bring them in and watch it unfold. <laughs> <laughs> I do feel like she's gotten savvier through her e exposure to Moira in a lot of ways. I mean, I think you sort of see that the person who in the second season, which you guys haven't seen, but in episode two, Moira comes and tries to like take over her home and she's like being very... <laughs> expertly smart about how she sort of, which I felt like she's learning in a strange way from these people, would yeah, you agree? Yeah, well, I would not let her in my kitchen. <laughs> would not. But still that smile. Still that smile. The whole yeah. Time. I mean, what have you enjoyed about sort of like that, the, how she's grown in that way in terms of the exposure to this family that we've seen over the course of the first year? Well, I love it. I mean, the more time the characters spend together, the more complicated and layered the relationships become. And, um, you know, Moira and, and Jocelyn have this thing and they genuinely care about each other. And, and working with Catherine is so amazing. And she always, we always kind of boil it down and go, how do we make these characters like each other? Because it's such a typical thing in a show to go, oh, these women are cat fighting again. And so it's finding that space and, and Catherine is so great at, at guiding the scenes that way, and I love that. I'm sorry, no, no, I'm gonna flatter you, and I know it makes you uncomfortable, but <laughs> I'm just doing Don't it. Don't say anything nice. I'm just doing it, I'm sorry. Um, <coughs> yeah, like, there is no, um, th they're in such different worlds that we yeah. don't compete. Yeah. There's no, there's no You're chance so of a cat her. fight. <laughs> no, <laughs> we just, I'm not, no, it's not up or down, it's just, I'm in my world, and yeah. you, I think you're in, Alexander as much as you McQueen. observe, you're outside Walmart. of yourself more than Moira. <laughs> <laughs> you're outside of yourself more, but still, you've got your world, and you've, you, you're the mayor's wife. Yeah. You know, so I've got nothing on you. But we're not, we're not competing at all. There's no. no, there's just, we're so far from each other, there's no point. Yeah. And you're not afraid of stepping up to Moira and, and speaking your mind, although you kind of tiptoe up and do it. 
it's you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. With a it's a delicate cookies. dance, Jocelyn's yeah. approach. It's very <laughs> sneaky and incredibly <laughs> passive aggressive. <laughs> but I think we're both looking at exotic creatures. Yeah. Yeah. No? yeah. We're both freaks to each other. Yeah. yeah. Looking through the glass at one another. <laughs> what are you? <laughs> I'm, I feel like also, you know, in a lot of ways, and like Stevie sort of serves as the audience's eyes in a lot of ways. I mean, this to me, what was really interesting about the pilot was, as you guys were saying before, on paper, they seem like one kind of person. And then you immediately realize that it's a much different entity in reality. For example, she is so savvy and so hip to this family, pretty much from the minute they get to town. And on paper, it would not seem that way. I felt like you, your character, had their number from the minute they got there. You knew exactly what was up with them. I mean, what did you like about the hurricane of terror that came into her life <laughs> in that first episode? I mean, what's not to like about, like, just, like, even for me, just sitting behind that desk and watching the parade of costumes <laughs> come in. No, but I did feel from the beginning that she really does stand in for the audience in mm -hmm. a way that I do get to watch this family like I think everybody at home watches this family, because most of us can relate, I think, a li initially a little more to, to Stevie's, Stevie than you guys in your yeah. black and white. <laughs> Fair assessment. Fair assessment. Yeah. But I mean, over the course of the first season, I felt like she not only came to sort of tolerate and like appreciate the family, but in a strange way feel like a surrogate member given the fact in a way they do all live together in this motel. Oh, I think she loved them from the very yeah. beginning. Like, <laughs> I, I think deep, especially for David, I feel like that was a um, kindred spirit in the sense of this is gonna be fun. <laughs> um, and and then I think I think it's surprised her in ways mm. that that she's felt like I, I think Stevie has surprised herself a lot um, in the way that she's felt things for and with this family. Yeah, absolutely. I did not see them sleeping together. By the way, if we're talking about things we did not see coming, <laughs> that would be one. Uh, but that's something that I love so much about. I love sleeping with Dan <laughs> so much. Yeah. Um, so. But that what? <laughs> and, uh, but this this friend relationship that you you've written is something that I I have in my own life with guy friends that it's it's a little more than platonic, but it's. Not like we're gonna really go, and there's something <laughs> with how many yeah. that is so much better yeah. than just friends or just like, and I don't even mean just the like touching, yeah. fooling around stuff, but the, the <laughs> relationship yeah. there that um, I've seen in life and I've never seen on screen before, and I love that's what I love the most about this. And I think in terms of just writing that dynamic as well, I mean, for me, it's one of my favorite things to write. And I think ultimately they're mirror images of each other just in very different contexts. Right. And I think, you know, David to his people in New York created this facade that was, you know, a gallery owner and had his shit together. And in a, in, in a parallel universe, Stevie has created this facade for herself, but they're both, I think, struggling with the realization of like, who, who am I? Yeah. You know, Stevie is like an incredibly strong-willed character working behind the desk at a motel. Something inherently is not right about that. <laughs> and yet, both of these characters, and I think that that's what's been so fun to play, is like, you know, pairing them and seeing what they can do for each other in terms of, I think they're prying each other out of their own sort of preconceived notions of who they were. Yeah, it does seem like they speak the same language amongst people who all speak sort of like different dialects of something that resembles <laughs> right. the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because there was that great scene af uh, before you guys, you got before your characters sleep together, where you're in the wine store and you're sort of, and you're like, I, I thought you drank red wine. And it's like, <laughs> it would, on the surface, it's very clear. So you're talking about wine, but like he instantly gets it, and he's like, "Well, sometimes I have red, and sometimes I have white, and one time I had a Merlot that used to be a Chardonnay." Like, it's amazing. <laughs> so you watched it. It's, but it's, 
<laughs> it's amazing how quickly and succinctly they really get each other. And I mean, I think that's what made sort of the way the relationship ended at the end of season one, like particularly devastating, because it felt like despite both of their best intentions and what they really wanted, they sort of like fucked themselves over in a crazy way. I mean, for you guys, when you were writing it and conceptualizing it, why was it important to sort of give like a really intense like heartache moment at the end of the first season? I think because David had been so closed off for so long. And I felt like if we didn't end the season giving the audience a glimpse into who he was, mm -hmm. that it might not land in the way that we had hoped, that the character wouldn't, you know, I mean, as, as, as I guess, David's person, um, you know, like, it's a fine line because he's very unlikable. And yet, I think the reason why people respond to him is because he doesn't know any better. Mm -hmm. So for that final episode, for Stevie to finally have cracked him open a little bit and revealed a loneliness that I think was really propelling him through the whole season, I think that was necessary in informing everything that comes yeah. next. Absolutely. The end of the season, Annie, was really interesting because your character uh, sort of had this up. I, I feel like almost more than anyone else, she was the most excited to get out of Schitt's Creek at the end of season one. <laughs> I jumped the highest. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh -huh. I mean, um, it, fe it feels like in a crazy way, like she thinks, whether it's true or not, that she has the most to get back to in her actual life. Well, obviously. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> I think, I mean, I think one of the reasons that she was so excited to get out of the town was because she, the town started making her feel things that she hadn't felt before. And that was a really scary prospect to her. Um, and also because she had <laughs> accepted or was basically engaged and, and then promptly cheated on her fiance, <laughs> uh, which is a conundrum that you, everyone would kind of want to hightail from. <laughs> um, but. I think I really think that the reason she wanted to get out of the town so much is because she was kind of maybe realizing that she was liking it a little bit more than she cared to. Yeah. yeah. Do you, I mean, do you feel like uh, what's interesting to me is the characters, as we were saying before, do grow, but like they don't grow a ton, like especially <laughs> over the course of the first, which I feel is mm -hmm. very important to the show. I mean, they can't end season one being like normal human beings. No. That, you know. Um, so, I mean, Danny, Eugene, for you, like, how fast, ideally, do you want these characters to grow? Like, how quickly do you want them to get hearts? <laughs> is it something that needs to take time because that's where the story is? Well, I think the fun part of the, no, we don't want them to grow too fast because it's more fun watching them now going through the slow process <laughs> of getting it together. And, and, and the other thing, too, is the, you know, this family that really wasn't so much a family when they had their money. Everybody was off doing their own thing and had their own thing going, and money was the answer to every problem. So there was never any real relationships. They never really discussed anything meaningful with their kids. There was really not much of a relationship in this family. And now that they're in this situation of living in two adjoining rooms in a motel in this little town, it is the slow uh, uh, realization. It's not even, that's not even the right word, realization, but it's the process that they're going through consciously and unconsciously of becoming a family and going through uh, kind of maternal things uh, for the first time and, and fe feelings of just what parents should do with their kids and, and, and you know, instilling, a, trying to instill whatever it is, a sense of discipline and, and tr you know, moral right and wrongs. This is something that just didn't happen in their previous life. So the fun over and above this family being in this town, it's the family themselves in this small little motel having to learn how to, you know, be a family. So the, you know, the process of what everybody's going through in terms of how fast they're learning anything, the joy to me is how slow yeah. 
everything is taking, mm -hmm. you know, because you get, you get to enjoy it more. I don't necessarily want to know where they're going to be, you know, two steps, you know, down the line. Um, don't want to get there too quick, you know. Um, so um, that, that's, that's, that's really one of the more precious aspects of this show to me is just how this family is slowly starting to act and respond to each other like a family. And I think the, the other thing too and, and is, you know, for dramatic effect, the fact that there is, you know, moments where <laughs> people act like a family in a normal situation, that's just normal people living their lives. In our show, it's an incredibly moving experience. <laughs> <laughs> so for the dramatic effect of it, it's been a really fun thing to play the, those, to sporadically play those emotional beats because I do feel like they, they have a, a bigger impact. I would agree with you. There's a scene, I believe it's in the second episode of season two, Catherine, where you, you and uh, Dan are making Right. Whatever that was. We try to make dinner. Right, you're that making is... dinner, which is a beautiful family thing. And there's actually a great moment, I believe it's in that, where you talk about before you met Eugene's character, you used to cook. You like this was never. This was not the life you were brought up in. You did not have a ton of money, and that was a really surprising character moment for me, given sort of the first season, you know, screaming for diamonds and the first episode <laughs> being concerned about your bag more than your missing son. And I liked that. <laughs> I mean, it was a nice bag, I'm sure. He uh, represent the bag represented by son. Of course. <laughs> But I really enjoyed that moment where we got such an insight as to who this woman was before the show started. And was that unexpected for you? Was that something you guys had talked about, sort of that backstory for Moira? It was, oh, uh, I always liked that idea. And we talked about it. We just never really put it in. There was a bit in the first season with Jocelyn. where Jocelyn, when we get stoned, and we're talking, <laughs> I said, I know people like this. I used yeah. to live around people like this without really telling too much, telling her too much. Um, yeah, that I, I like to think that I was a bit of a scrapper. You know, and, and that's maybe why, it, to my mind, this town is even more of a threat to Moira is because Moira lived this life mm -hmm. and I don't want to go back. Mm -hmm. I've already tasted this and I got away from it and I married a guy who was really successful and promised me the world and I had it for a while and now we're back here. And, you know, once you've had it and you were somebody who wanted to get away from it, you, you know, and Moira doesn't want to be there. Absolutely. So, yeah. So, but I, but I love, yeah, getting to leak stuff like that and... Yeah. But these are moments too that are coming up this season that you kind of see more of these these moments of of kind of revealing character and where real, real fam familial relationships start to new things start to happen that everybody in the family are feeling for the first time kind of. Yeah, well, I would love to talk about that because I think the the great and difficult thing about a first season show that has you know, you have less than 30 minutes to tell one episode of television, which is difficult in any world. But I think you did an amazing job establishing a world. You really knew who these characters were before the first season even came to an end. But for you guys, what excites you about the opportunities afforded to you in season two and the things you get to reveal about these characters? I think to cut the tie of circumstance is a really important thing. I think the first season we were all, you know, we were servicing the situation they were in where are the characters now in relation to wanting to leave? How far can you take them away from that end goal? And I think to leave the first season with them essentially being stranded in this town opened up like an entire world, uh, a narrative world for us that explored interrelationships as opposed to a relationship to a circumstance. And I think the minute we were able to sort of do that, you're also able to sort to to dig a little deeper in terms of the relationships and and uh, and really sort of mine moments between all these people that that will resonate in a slightly more emotional way than they did in the first season. Has it been fun for you guys to sort of have those opportunities to expand upon your characters in season two? Oh yeah, well I, th I think especially when you say mine those moments like where uh, my character left off I had declared that I loved you and um, <laughs> you didn't like me back in the <laughs> same way <laughs> and, and then he takes off and that would be one 
thing. If he takes off, you never see him again. But then he came back, and to and I, and not just you, but the family coming back. Like they'd left all. I'm not articulating this right, but to be faced with that again right. and have to deal with it, to like be faced with. Um, moving on and how are we going to navigate this new relationship everything's going to be done in the robot though <laughs> <laughs> um, but but i i think that's what's really exciting and, and hard and lifelike and ultimately funny because uh, it's awkward <laughs> so. absolutely uh so we're going to open it up to your questions now if you have a question just raise your hand and i believe there's a microphone situation so that will be passed so just be bold somebody just be the how about this lady somebody right here by the microphone <laughs> yep do i stand sure let's <laughs> absolutely hi uh, hi. hi all right i'll stand <laughs> I'm Kimberly, I love the show, and I'm from Long Island, and Annie, you so perfectly play Jewish American princess that I <laughs> <laughs> went to school with, and I <laughs> wonder, like, did, did you, where, where is your influence, or what do you base the character on, or did you have experiences like that? Uh, yeah, I mean, fortunately, unfortunately, there's a lot of that floating around on the internet <laughs> and social media and the you know pop culture um, I don't think I drew on any one person necessarily but certainly there were like a lot of ladies out there kind of that were percolating in my head as I was thinking about Alexis um, it's not Annie at all, by the way. She's the nicest human being. <laughs> so lovely. Thank you. We're drinking afterwards. So yeah, no, I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, basically I'm just a really nice person in real life. <laughs> but, I mean, to your point, it was when, when we were auditioning the character, there were, it was a very, there were very few people that could encapsulate that, and in the end, there were like two people. What? Um, <laughs> no, that's what I was thinking. Um, there was another one? And. Did so she let her study somebody? And she wasn't available. It, there was, <laughs> there was a, a, an innate likability that had to be brought to the character. There had to be something, you know what I mean? There had to be that, that thing, and. Um, She's so innocent. And Annie brought this like incredibly bizarre, like <laughs> I'd never seen anything like it. She sort of walked into the audition in, in Los Angeles with like a bun on her head and like a, like a kimono top. And <laughs> you know, when, when you're playing with it on paper, it's time. very much like originally we had played it very sort of, you know, to our mistake, like caricature. Um, and, and there were, you know, the opportunity to sort of create a dimensional um, girl who was so well-intentioned. <laughs> I think that's what makes Alexis so likable, is the fact that she is undeniably self-involved, and yet <laughs> tries so desperately to do her best for other people, it just can't step in the way of her own right. self-interest. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so it was, you know, it was... Um, it was very important that that, that likability be, be there and, and be sort of an intrinsic thing. I love how Alexis's daily life has changed the least of all the Rose family. <laughs> she's concerned with boys and what she's wearing. It's full and blown hair. having a party. It's yeah. like, your life is basically the same, but just on a much different scale. Yeah, you can plunk her into like any given scenario and she'll <laughs> find her way. Yeah, she adapts very yeah. well. Very well. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, next question. Uh, <clears throat> or, Whoever. <laughs> Hi there. I'm Natasha. I love you guys, all of you. It's Hi. such a great show. We um, love you. I, <laughs> I have a question. Where did the names come from? Myra just fits so perfectly. I just was wondering if there was any influence or how you chose names for all the characters because they just fit so well. I'm curious about that. <laughs> it just I came up, Moira. Uh, Moira Stevie. came Stevie from... Buzz, I can almost tell the background of every name. <clears throat> Jocelyn is one of my closest friends' middle names, and I always thought it was a really special name. <laughs> Alexis was a girl I went to middle school with 
who was not someone I enjoyed. <laughs> Stevie was a friend of a friend who had the coolest name I'd ever heard. And of course, the Stevie Nicks reference, but I had yeah. known a Stevie and I thought, what a cool, you're just, we don't even need to write you anymore. Like that's just a <laughs> cool yeah. factor, just intrinsic. Um, and then, yeah. Wasn't what, her who father else? originally, I think way back when, wasn't she, wasn't her father he a was a, was a roadie, roadie who got asked to not be a roadie for Fleetwood Mac. Aww. For Fleetwood Mac, yes. <laughs> they put, they put out a the band. Yeah, restraining order on him. <laughs> Funny. But yeah, so Stevie, Stevie, Stevie Nicks. Bud. Stevie, yeah, Stevie, Stevie Bud. Yeah, Stevie Bud. Like Stevie Bud. But I mean, it's more than that, it's Rosebud, too. Rosebud. Which I really enjoyed. <gasps> Once it like clicked for me and I realized, I was like, that's a really sweet thing. <laughs> <laughs> not only that, early on in shooting, either the pilot or when we did the first episode, um, uh, it dawned on me, I went, Eugene, shits don't smell like roses. <laughs> oh, and you went, what? <laughs> I said, you thought of that. You guys, did you think of shits and smell like roses? To be perfectly and... honest, yeah. no. <laughs> That's I didn't great. Think of rosebud, I just got this. I'm rosebud? Wow. Rosebud. If we were married in Quebec, we'd have to be rosebud. Yeah, <laughs> we would. Yeah. That would be really uh -oh. weird. Oh, but da, 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 da. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I thought Did of Did we Rosebud. answer the question? <laughs> yes, okay. I, so. yeah, I, I can't remember. Um, yes. Hmm. Uh, thank you. I'm sure Alexis will be thrilled wherever she is watching this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think I see a hand all the way in the back. The, oh, yeah, you have a bellowing voice. <laughs> you, sir, can sit here. Yeah. yeah. Way to go. There's a, there's a live stream okay. element. Oh, it's streaming. <laughs> yeah. I see. Uh, we came in a little late, so I might have missed this, but uh, it's called Shit Street. The, uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, where is, is, is this a set or is this an actual place that you found and where did you find it? The, uh, the actual town? Yes, yes. Uh, the town is, is a town um, that is about 45 minutes northeast of Toronto, where we shoot the show, and... Uh, it's not all, called Schitt's Creek. It, <laughs> and it's, it's not called Schitt's Creek, but it is called Goodwood. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> and the people of Goodwood love to be residents of Schitt's Creek. <laughs> Just a change of pace. Uh, so that's that's the, that is where the town is, and and the and the motel is in an adjacent community called Hockley Valley, um, and you know most of the interiors we shoot in Toronto uh, in studio. And um, but the mot motel is a set, and the, the motel cafe is, is a set, set yes, and all the interiors are yeah are sets. Hmm. Oh, uh, you've ruined sorry. It. Well, sorry. So there is no shit. Wait, now. They're leaving now. Way to kill the reality there. Hi. Speaking of Shits Creek, I was wondering if anyone objected to calling the show that, and if you had to come up with alternative titles for the show. We kind of knew that would be a bit of an issue, <laughs> um, but it was. Um, you know, it was kind of a, we knew it would be kind of conversation over a water cooler when it first came on. Oh, honey. <laughs> um, what is our, my daughter, Sarah, plays Twyla. Stand up, take a bow. Stand up and take a bow. How could I be looking right there and not? Don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, I guess we'll discuss it later. Um, yeah, we, we knew it would be kind of a, you know, an, an issue, but it just seemed that the name is just an appropriate name for the show. Not, I mean, kind of because of the family situation. Paul. Oh, my God. I know, I just saw. <laughs> One of our, One we of only our have directors, two directors. Paul Fox. Paul, stand up, please. Paul Fox. Um, 
So we knew it would be an issue, but it just seemed like an appropriate name for the show. And the and it is, of course, it is kind of a real name. There was a um, uh, someone at the CBC over a, a boardroom meeting who at one point was like, um, <laughs> what if... Um, what if we called it Up Creek? <laughs> and my dad and I from across the table were like, yeah, I don't think that's gonna, <laughs> don't think that's gonna work. Um, and after that, they just went with it. Well, it is, we did, and also we did take, we did, there were, you know, you know, shits on every page in just about every phone book, you know, that we kind of, you know, kind of, Schitt's Creek is a legitimate place in and it, Ireland. It actually is the name of a Ireland. legitimate place in Ireland, <laughs> so. as we found out after the fact, spelled exactly the same way. Um, so the fact that it was a real name and, you know, It made it for is. some great late night bits. Uh, yeah. My daughter's five and she's taught everyone in her kindergarten class. <laughs> no. The name of Mommy's show. <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Did so, the name have to so be something sorry, like Jen. that because We'd n we've never been to this town before we had to live here, right? We only bought it As because of the yeah. joke. Right. Of name. course. That's and the, the family, we own it. you know, the family doesn't want to be living there either <laughs> for that <laughs> particular reason. So it all sort of fell into <laughs> place. Jennifer, how do you like having Jocelyn shit on your resume now? I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and we talked one day, I remember, on set about her maiden name was Brown. <laughs> <laughs> So she decided not to hyphenate. I think he's the conversation around. It looked good on paper. It was, you know, it's surprising to say the best role that you've had in your entire career is somebody named Jocelyn Shit. <laughs> well, I'm glad we didn't go with a hyphenate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, so good. Uh, do we have, yep, this gentleman right here? How did Chris Elliott and John Hemphill get involved in the show? Well, Chris was 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 again kind of a a first choice because I although I, I I hadn't we hadn't met Chris before, but he just kind of exuded the kind of smarm. <laughs> sorry, it's okay. That. <laughs> Uh, that Roland, you know, kind of, you know, was to have. And I've been a fan of Chris's for years and years, right? So going way back to The Letterman Show, and, and he just makes me laugh. But he is kind of, he can play that so well. <laughs> uh, and uh, John Hempel uh, is uh, an old dear friend that, uh, that we know going back to Toronto, an old Second City guy that did a couple of years uh, on SCTV with us uh, our last uh, couple of seasons uh, when the cast was kind of, you know, dwindling a little bit. So he was a great utility player that came in and did some amazingly funny stuff. And uh, John really has that small town thing that he, what Chris can do with Smarm, John can do kind of with, you know, that, that uh, small town thing and he's he's created a, a really interesting character because he's on the surface very likable but you just don't know what's going on under there. <laughs> you just don't know whether he'd kind of you know s screw you or you know what I mean he's just got you never you just don't you can't get deep enough kind of and it keeps it keeps it very interesting and Bob is back in a in a pretty big way. In yeah. Well, this season, yes, Bob is uh, <laughs> much more present, I think. Um, uh, yeah. Do we have a last question from the audience? Yep. Thank you. So I know it's a scripted comedy, of course, um, but you're also wildly talented at improvisation. Mm -hmm. Like, are, how much of it is improvised too? We have great scripts. Yeah. But you know, on the on the day, you know, because it's that we have great scripts, I think it inspires other ideas and, and we get to try things and sometimes things aren't working great or there's just a moment and you know, we have the freedom and, and the good brains to um, you know, to work around it, work with it and come up with stuff. It's fun. It's very I, I don't personally I don't feel the need to improvise in any of these scenes, but but I'm inspired once in a while and and I know I have the freedom to do it, which is really nice. 
to work with people you trust, you know, who trust you. That's, if anything, am I lying? Is, uh, <laughs> no, you're not, you're not lying, Kevin. Uh, <laughs> no, you're, you, you speak truth. Um, yes, no, it's true. We don't, uh, and if anything happens, usually improvising happens more maybe toward the end of the day, um, <laughs> where you just keep adding things as the scene ends, you know, uh, and a lot of times that those little snippets are, are used in a, in a big way and become a very funny part of the scene. But, you know, it's not, um, I wouldn't say there's a whole no, gang I, of improvising. I think it's more, like, I would say it's more collaborative than anything else. And I, I, I think particularly in the first season and, and more specifically in the, in the first episode of the first season, I think we wanted everyone to personalize what they were doing in a way that made them feel comfortable and also allowed, I mean, fortunately, we have an amazing cast. And you know, these are all people that we trust inherently. So for me, I, I remember sitting down uh, with Emily and sitting down with Annie um, before we started the yeah, show. You never sat down, you never sat. <laughs> <laughs> Most specifically, because we had all our scenes together. <laughs> and I just, you know, we would we sat down and I, I said, well, is there anything in, the, in this first episode that you don't feel jives with what you want to do? Is there anything? And they both had incredible input into who these people were. And that was reflected in the pilot episode of the show and I think really informed their characters from there on out. I mean, I do feel like the great thing about the first episode of this series is that these characters are fully formed and there's not a lot of movement that's not deliberate mm -hmm. that happens. I feel like sometimes you watch a show and like suddenly a character has been swapped out halfway through a season <laughs> and it's because they weren't working. I feel like all of these characters worked and that's that's because everyone brought such a personal touch to what they And you guys start do. to write really to, for us too, our strengths yeah. and stuff. I think the only improvising that happens a lot, at least for me, is when I see what you're wearing. And that usually <laughs> will sometimes inform something like if you have a squirrel on your back. <laughs> we were saying too that the amount of times that I've like opened that door and said something or looked at her and she's looked at me, it's like you could cut a montage yeah. together of just a thousand and one, hello. <laughs> yeah. And then always the goodbyes at the door are Best always wishes. fun. Those are always sort yeah. of in the moment, whatever sort of happens, but you know. And it should be noted Dan, that you are really sort of like the costume visionary in a lot of ways about like what the show looks like and all of these people. I mean, why was sort of putting that signature touch on the show so integral, you think? I just, I think because I, I, I just wanted it to look how I wanted it to look. <laughs> I had a very had a specific <laughs> idea for how I wanted it to yeah. look. And fortunately we had an amazing team. Um, but for some reason, I don't know why, and I, I really don't know why anyone trusted me, um, but I had a, a very specific aesthetic for the show, and I think particularly in the wardrobe, you know, as, as Catherine said, the wardrobe in the show is, is a character like unto itself, and I think particularly for the Rose family, it's the only visual indication of where they've come from. Mm -hmm. And it allows us to not have to constantly write about the past. It, it, it projects where we've come from in such a clear way that it does all the writing for itself. So when we've sat down with Deborah Hansen, who's our amazing costume designer, the first thing I said to her was, these clothes have to be very, <laughs> very expensive looking. Yeah. And she had a minor heart attack um, <laughs> because Canadian wardrobe budgets, believe it or not, are not very big. Um, Especially with the dollar. So yeah. we really sat down and brainstormed how we were going to give this family the million dollar wardrobe that they, they should have. And a lot of that, mm -hmm. again, was eBaying, it was a lot of designer consignment. It was, you know, and, and I'm, I'm collecting it all through the year because you just can't afford to buy it in a department store. So it was very important. And I think it, I think it sort of helped, helped tremendously with the show. Catherine, how many wigs would you estimate you've worn so far on the show? <laughs> oh, there are so many more I haven't unpacked yet. <laughs> <laughs> There are, there are whole families waiting. 
<laughs> in fact, I just received an email today that just said Moira's wigs, and it was from our hair person who's acquiring new wigs for, for our, our new season. So it's there was a long question list of well, how do what kind of wigs and what. How many wigs and what, what are the kinds? Are they synthetic hair? What kind of wigs are we looking at? <laughs> Everything. So, you know. I like that. So, more wigs, to more wigs season yeah. two and three. But season two of Schitt's Creek premieres March 16th at 8 o'clock on top. Guys, thank you so much for being here. Thank you to Kelly Sandra.